Okay. So welcome back everyone to the second session for today. And uh, our next lecture would be given by Gerard Neumann, who is a professor at KIT and head of Autonomous Learning Robots Lab in the, at KIT as well. So can we welcome the speaker? Hello, hello. Uh, this, this is much better. Yeah, um, so this is a very wide field. So I took a few topics out of it and that were the most interesting for me. And let's see that it's also interesting for you. And, and I think it fits very nicely to the talk that we have seen previously. Um, but let me start with motivating the topic. So why do we look at robotics? My standard answer is because it's actually a lot of fun to watch these robots learn. <laughs> Um, so you see different examples where you can use re reinforcement learning in robotics, like robot manipulation for, in, for dexterous hands. That's an example from OpenAI, or also for LACT robotics. And the things you can learn with reinforcement learning are actually quite, quite nice. Um, but obviously, there is also a huge economic and industrial potential in using reinforcement learning for robotics. So like for bin picking problems, assembly, disassembly, agriculture, service robots. Reinforcement learning is not really used so far. So we are not there yet. But I think it will not take too much longer. So maybe the next five years and we'll see a, a big impact there. Um, so, but the, the, the third answer is robotics is a very, very challenging problem. Yeah, and it unifies almost all the big challenges in reinforcement learning. So it's a very good test bed for reinforcement learning algorithms. So what are the challenges? So in red, you have here the challenges and some of the solution concepts here in green. I won't have time to cover all of them, but we go into a few of them. So yeah, what are the challenges? So data obviously is very, very costly. Yeah, on the real robot, we just cannot run millions of trials. That's not possible. Yeah, the robot will break. Uh, um, then you have very high dimensional observations. Usually you want to learn directly from cameras. You have high dimensional states, high dimensional actions, and so on. Um, partial obs observability, you cannot observe the real state. Uh, you can only get the state by some sensors like the camera. Um, doesn't tell you many things like oh, with occlusions, you have to deal with that. Um, then exploration and finding the correct policy partnerization is another uh, very hard challenge. So on a robot, you better not explore the standard reinforcement learning way, yeah, which would be more like this random walk. Right? This will break your robot. Right? It's very dangerous. Um, and also how to define rewards is, is a huge challenge. So for um, complex manipulation tasks, for example, it's unclear whether you how to, to write the reward down. Yeah. Um, and, and there are different methods for that as well. Um, so in this lecture, I want to go into three of these this challenges and, um, and, 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 and offer you some solution concepts for that. So the first one is how to, to tackle sample complexity and continuous actions uh, in deep reinforcement learning. And here we'll look at off-policy actor-critic algorithms and maximum entropy reinforcement learning, also which is highly connected to, to what we have seen previously. Um, then I will talk about robust policy optimization, which are optimization methods that you need uh, for complex high dimensional action spaces, uh, which typically occur in robotics. And here we'll introduce you a new algorithm um, similar to PPO, TPO, uh, that is called differentiable trust region layers that has some beneficial properties. And in the end, I want to talk about policy representations and how you can use them to get better exploration properties. And here I want to talk about mo motion primitives and also black box optimization as a variant of deep, deep reinforcement learning. Okay. And, and yeah, so if you have questions during my talks, then feel free to raise your hand and we can directly discuss it. Um, Okay, but before I want to jump into this topic, I want to 
tell you a little bit about what are the systems we want to learn on. Uh, and there, I think there are two um, groups in the community. One group is mainly doing things on simulation and then to try to transfer the learned uh, policies to the real robot. And here we have the, the advantage now that many of the simulations uh, get more and more powerful right now. We have these three different simulators that I show here, for example, Mojako, Sapiens, and Isaac, or Isaac Sim. Um, and obviously, with a simulation, it's much easier to work. Uh, so the, you can use many, many more samples because if you can massively parallelize it. Um, so you can use methods that are actually data inefficient, but computationally fast. And, and this is also an advantage of certain methods here. Yeah? In, but in the end, there will always be a seem to real gap. But simulation, for example, can be used as, as an efficient pre-training, and then you only have to fine tune on, on the real robot. Huh? And what things you can simulate already is complex robot um, contact dynamics, for example, here for a box pushing task, how to box, uh, push, push a box to a desired location. Um, here, the Sapiens simulator. Uh, can basically simulate various manipulation tasks at once. It's very fast. Can simulate it on, G on GPU. Um, and here, this it looks like actually a real robot. It's a simulated robot where you even can simulate how to screw a nut on the bolt, which uh, including the deformations on the nut and something like that. Yeah. Um, On the other hand, many people also try to directly learn on the, on the robot. That's much harder. So here you really have to use algorithms that are much more data efficient. Usually these algorithms are computationally very slow. So that's a disadvantage. Yeah? And they also usually have a higher bias. We come into that. Higher bias means they give you a policy faster with less samples, but the quality of the policy is usually not that good in comparison to the more data inefficient uh, algorithms. Um, so, yeah, things people have done here is, for example, also directly learning on the robot is contact rich manipulations like back in the hole, uh, the elect robotics task that you can see here, or a pin pick picking task from Google. Um, on the real robot, obviously, it's, it's much harder to parallelize it. Um, you can only do that if you're Google and have seven or 20 of these robots. Um, Usually, you cannot afford that. Uh, um, OK. So that's basically the bigger picture of these two different um, families in the research community. And we will have a look into both well, what kind of algorithms we can use. Uh, um, PowerPoint is always resisting after these videos here. So I'll come on the next slides. No, yeah, okay. Uh, and for the types of algorithms we can use, I, I, I actually like this this kind of categorization quite well, uh, nice, uh, quite well, which is stolen from Sergei Levin's lecture, but I want to flash it here. Um, where you have a very coarse categorization of reinforcement learning algorithms, and you can more or less divide it into on policy and off policy algorithms. So. And the on-policy algorithms are usually policy gradient methods, such like PPO and TPO. They do have a low bias, so to say, because they directly optimize what you want to optimize, the so return. Now, there is, at least in the plain version, there is no approximation in it. You don't rely on the Q function. The Q function could be wrong. It will be wrong. So here, no, you directly optimize the return. It's, and that uh, leads usually to better policies in the end. Uh, um, they are also computationally very fast, yeah, so typically 10 times, if not more, faster than uh, um, uh, of policy algorithms. Um, but they cannot really reuse data. That's why it's called on policy. So you can only use data from the current policy. All the old data you have generated, you need to throw away. Yeah, so I think that has been covered to some extent in the policy gradient lecture. Right. 
Um, so direct learning on the robot is infeasible, but for learning on a, simulation, on a simulator, actually, that's quite nice because the algorithm is very fast computationally. And if you can parallelize your simulator, then you, you should use these kind of algorithms. Um, on the other hand, there are off policy methods, which are basically in the field of approximate dynamic programming, which we have just heard in the previous talk. You know, so they can reuse all experienced transitions from before. Yeah? You're using a replay buffer, you can basically learn your Q function. Yeah? Um, so that's better suited for real robot tasks yeah? because it's much more data efficient. Yeah? But they have a higher bias. Yeah, with higher bias, the gradient we estimate for the policy, it's biased, it's wrong, yeah? because of our approximation of the Q function. The Q function will never be really accurate. Yeah? Um, and we have heard a lot about approximate dynamic programming, DQN, basically, for discrete actions. Um, was a little bit covered, continuous actions, also in the previous talk, but what I want to show you here now is basically how you would really implement that for continuous actions. Huh? And these are basically three quite famous algorithms. DDPG, Deep Deterministic Policy Gradients, uh, DD3, and SAC, and we'll quickly go into them. Uh, in the first part of my talk. Um, so these algorithms are basically like Q learning. Uh, so they do off policy learning, you can reuse all the data that you've ever experienced to learn the Q function, uh, but they don't use the max operator. Uh, they use also a policy representation uh, and use the Q function to update this policy representation. Typically, if you talk about continuous basis, this is a Gaussian policy. Uh, because this is the only distribution we can efficiently sample from in a continuous space. Uh, so, <laughs> so, so what is the bottleneck? The optimization of the Q function. Uh, we have to find the maximum over the actions. Uh, and and off policy sector critic methods basically to do two steps. So they first of all have to update the critic for the current policy. So the difference, again, to um, TQN is that you don't do it for the optimal policy, but for the current policy. Uh, um, and then you have to update the actor. Uh, and there are different variants for doing that. Yeah? This a stochastic actor update, which would be using a traditional policy gradient. Uh, the deterministic actor updates which are these DDPG and DD3 algorithms, and I call it a variational actor update because it's inspired by variational inference, which is the soft actor critic algorithm. Um, and we'll quickly go into all three of them. Uh, um, so, but for the critic, I, yeah, I mean, it's more or less the same what we have also heard in the previous talk. So this is basically the, the DQN learning rule, the only difference from DQN, um, from standard DQN is that usually we have the max operator here, but now we do have a policy, uh, this is a Gaussian policy, and we want to compute the ex expectation over the Q value in the next state. Uh, and so we can basically approximate this expe expectation by sampling, so we just sample from our uh, policy in, in the next state, uh, compute the average, and if you're lazy, we typically, we typically are lazy, we set uh, the number of samples to one and then we can just basically uh, do that. Um, um, for the actor update, um, so what you have learned already in the policy gradient lecture would be this update here. Uh, so you, you basically have an the policy gradient objective, which is basically you want to optimize the expectation with respect to the policy of the advantage function. Uh, um, and then you can use basically the policy gradient for that, so the likelihood ratio. Uh, um, but you can do this, uh, but it's rather inefficient to do it like this. Uh, it has high variance because you only use samples from your actions. You don't use knowledge about the Q function. Uh, because now the big difference to standard on policy methods, or like policy gradient methods, like PPO, is we, we know the Q function. 
We have learned it. We know the approximate Q function. Right? And so a, a better thing to do here is to, to, to basically use the knowledge about the Q function, so the derivative of the Q function, to uh, also get the gradient of the policy. And we'll look into that, how this works. So, and the first algorithm that introduced that was called deep deterministic policy gradient algorithm. Uh, um, it's still used quite okay, yeah, but I think the SAC algorithm is right, I understand it. Um, but the, the issue, as I've already said, with the standard policy gradient algorithm, if you would use it here, is that you don't use all information you have. Yeah, you, you know the information, or you know the gradients of the Q function with respect to the actions as well. It's a neural network. So why don't we use this information? Uh, so, and for the mystic policies, this is a TDPG algorithm. For stochastic policies, this is a SAC, a soft actor critic algorithm. Uh, so, and the idea of TDPG is actually very simple. Uh, so we want to have a deterministic policy in the end, we will use a stochastic policy by just adding some noise on top of it, but the noise is fixed, uh, that approximates these argmarks over the Q function. Uh, and because now this is a deterministic policy, we can, we don't have to write it as an expectation over the actions. And we can directly plug in the, the action here. Uh, so our objective changes in a way that the Q function is evaluated at the action that my policy is specifying. Uh, and now I can compute the gradient with respect to the parameters of the policy, theta, in this case. Um, and this is now a plain application of the chain rule. Uh, so if I, if I want to do that, I get the gradient of the Q function with respect to the actions times the, the gradient of the policy with respect to the parameters. Uh, and this gives us basically, uh, in this way we reuse or we use the gradient information of Q with respect to the actions, and this gradient is usually has a much lower variance, it's much more accurate than the standard policy gradient, if you would use that. Uh, um, Then the next extension of this idea uh, was a twin delayed TDPG algorithm, which is called DD3. Uh, and twin delayed TDPG um, is basically again connected to the overestimation bias. Uh, I think there were one or two slides in DQN. What is the overestimation bias? So there's this double uh, um, DQN algorithm, which is solving that. Um, the overestimation bias is basically always telling us that the Q function, which we we'll estimate with approximate uh, dynamic programming, it will always, uh, it's typically overestimated. Uh, and the reason for that is the maximum operator. Uh, we use the maximum operator for the Q value in the next state, in the next time step, and because the Q values are not accurate, they're noisy, we overestimate that. And this will be propagated back uh, in through the state space and will get a quite high error. Uh, and in a double Q learning algorithm, it was a very easy fix. We just use basically uh, the target network for, select, for computing the Q value of uh, the policy, uh, where we, but, but for, for computing the best, uh, for commuting the best action, we used the real Q, not the target network, but the real Q network. Um, here, now we don't have a max operator anymore, yeah, because in our critic update, we just have the expectation over the actions, isn't it? But still, this policy the, has been used, uh, the, the Q function has been used to optimize the policy. So if the Q function is wrong, the policy will be wrong. Uh, um, so you still have this correlation between error in the Q function, error in the policy, and that is exactly causing this overestimation problem. Uh, um, 
basically, which you can also see here in this plot, and if you would now evaluate, uh, for example, DDPG, and ask him what is the expected Q value, uh, you would basically get this estimate. If you compute the real expected Q, uh, uh, Q values or returns, then you get a value, an estimate that is that is much higher. Uh, so this is exactly the uh, that, is, that is much lower. So that's exactly the overestimation problem. Um, so the twin delayed TDPG algorithm tries to solve that in a, in a quite simple way. That is, they basically say, um, let's just use two different Q functions. Yeah? So we learn two Q functions, and we also learn two different policies. Yeah? That, that, that would be the main idea. And for updating uh, policy one, you, we use Q function two, and for updating policy two, we use Q, Q function one. So we decorrelate the error in the Q function with the error in the policy. Huh? So that would in theory work and, and wouldn't give you any overestimation bias or less overestimation bias. But in practice, these two Q functions that you learn, that you learn it from the same data set. And so, so the results will be highly correlated. Uh, so that, that doesn't really help. The easy fix for that is actually instead of saying we have an overestimation bias, let's introduce an underestimation bias with using the minimum operator here. So for computing the target values for your um, critic, you use the minimum over both Q functions, whatever the, the Q functions tell you. Uh, and then you underestimate the Q values, but underestimation is not that bad because it doesn't propagate over the state space because the policy won't use these actions if, if, you, if you underestimate them. The, only, the optimization will only force the policy to use actions that are overestimated. Uh, so using this, this, this simple trick, and now basically more or less all the actor critic of policy actor critic methods are using that um, very easy to implement um, you can avoid it now the only um, issue is that you need two different Q functions uh, so it's computationally a little bit harder to do uh, so here that's basically the, the algorithm the DD3 algorithm um, and it's a very simple variant of approximate dynamic programming basically where you just have to to update using the chain rule. And you also use target networks for the Q function as well as for the policy. And here uh, they, they use uh, not the standard rule that after some time we update these target networks, but we use Polyak averaging, which is quite equivalent with a, with a tau here that is pretty close to one. So you slowly move the target network after, basically to follow the real networks. Um, okay, so now we know how it works for the domestic policies, but the domestic policies have the problem, okay, you need to explore as well, isn't it? So you need to add noise, and if you don't optimize for the noise, then usually you, it's very hard to set the noise levels, you get stuck in local optima and so on. Right? So you, you want to use something with stochastic policies in the end. Uh, um, and yeah, okay, this is just a slide saying that DD3 is better than DDPG, okay. Uh, um, and this is a soft actor critic algorithm. And yeah, so the so solution is basically uh, to keep diversity uh, or entropy in our policy high. Uh, and that's, that's exactly the maximum entropy reinforcement learning problem that we have already uh, seen before. Uh, so we define now a new objective where I basically say I have the Q function, I want to my, my policy to optimize the Q function, but at the same time, I want that my policy is also optimizing the, the entropy. Uh, and the entropy is a natural information theoretic measure for uncertainty, or maybe also diversity, of, of the action choice, of, of the behavior. Um, and so you can see the equation here. Uh, for 
for the distributions that we usually use in continuous spaces, Gaussian distributions, you do have a closed form solution. That's what you can see here as well. Uh, um, so, and this closed form solution, it only depends on the variance of the Gaussian distribution on, on the covariance matrix. Uh, um, in most cases, actually, our Gaussian distributions that we use, the variance doesn't depend on the state, so also the entropy of the policy doesn't depend on the state. It's a constant over the state. Huh? Um, yeah, and the entropy of a Gaussian distribution, it can be negative as well. Also in, in discrete spaces that cannot happen, but in uh, continuous spaces, it's a differential entropy there, it can happen. Um, and how uh, the soft actor critic algorithm now formalizes the actor update, you can see that here. Yeah. And that's also what we have seen in the previous talk. Um, so we want to find a policy that maximizes the, the, the expected Q values. At the same time, we want to have entropy in there. Um, and, oh, this should be a plus here, plus entropy. Oh, sorry for that. Um, and uh, th which leads basically to this objective. Um, we could again use now the standard likelihood ratio, policy gradient for, uh, for that, yeah, that is written here. Um, have, but again, we have the same issues. It has a high variance, needs a lot of samples, and doesn't make use of the gradient information of Q. Uh, so, and the message here is, if you have gradient information of your objective that you want to optimize, you should use it. Uh, um, and in this case, it's a reprogrammatization trick. It was also mentioned from, from Matthew's talk, but he didn't really go into that. So who knows here what the reprogrammatization trick is? Only a few people, so that's that, that's good. So I, I can go into that a little bit more because it's a very, very important trick. It's, it's not just used in reinforcement learning, it's used in machine learning all over the place. Uh, um, so the reparameterization trick solves the following problem. Uh, so we want to uh, find a distribution, uh, P over X, this one, that maximizes this expectation. Uh, it's now very general. Uh, and this distribution is parameterized by some theta parameters. Uh, um, if we don't have gradient inf information for f, the only way to, to get to this gradient would be the likelihood ratio that we have already learned. If we have gradient information over f, we should use reparameterization. Re re uh, so how does it work? So we can reparameterize expectation in the following way. So we introduce a new random variable, xi, with a, that is distribu distributed by q of xi. Uh, and q doesn't have parameters, it's parameter free. Uh, for example, it's just a Gaussian with zero mean and unit variance. Uh, and then we also define a mapping h that has now some parameters, t dumb, and this mapping transforms this xi into x. Uh, and if you have such a mapping, such that uh, these x's are distributed according to p of theta and x after the transformation, then obviously both expectations are the same. Uh, so this expectation with respect to p of theta is the same as the expectation with respect to the distribution Q of Xi, F of H of Xi. Uh, and the trick that we use now is basically that the random variable uh, is uh, basically the, the, the parameters, we, we first had it at the distribution, now we have the parameters here in the function that is used basically to call F. Uh, and so let me give you one example, and that's also the standard example that we will use, Gaussian distributions. Uh, so for Gaussian distributions, let's say the B 
of x is the Gaussian distribution with mean and covariance. So our parameters are the mean and the covariance matrix. Right. Um, then I can basically again define this distribution Q with all the parameters as zero mean unit, unit variance distribution. And the mapping H theta of Xi is the mean plus a, a matrix transpose times Xi, where the A matrix is the Trulesky decomposition of the covariance matrix. Huh? And it's very easy to show basically that then this P of X is, is, is that I get when I transform Xi into X into X is the same as the original distribution. And that's basically the standard way how we use the repolarization track. Because now we can compute the gradients not based on this equation here, but based on this equation. Uh -huh. And as we know, Q doesn't depend on, on theta, so we, we, we don't care. Um, but H depends on theta, and here we can again estimate or, or compute the chain rule in order to get the gradients. Uh -huh. um, and basically, that's the way how you should do it, how you compute a policy gradient if you know the gradients of the objective. Yeah? Much more efficient than the standard policy gradient way. <laughs> so for, for the actor update, uh, or back to the, to the SAC algorithm, it would look the following, uh, that our policy is a neural network. Yeah? So usually it gives us a mean that depends on the state, and it could also be a covariance matrix that depends on the state, or in, in this case, where you, the network is giving us the Cholesky of the covariance matrix. So if I compute A transpose times A, I get the covariance matrix. This could be state dependent. In most cases, it's not, but not just to state general. Let's say it's state dependent. Then our mapping function H depends on S, on the state, and on Xi. It's basically as defined before. And then we can just plug that in the gradient for the SAC algorithm, so we have it here for the Q function, but also here for the entropy term. Um, and basically then we get an unbiased gradient estimator, or it's unbiased with respect to the Q function. The Q function will be biased, um, but given this Q function, it's unbiased gradient estimate. Uh, um, and basically this algorithm now extends this DPG style of policy gradient computation to stochastic policies. Uh, so we can also get a gradient for our noise. Uh, and that's exactly what SAC is doing. Uh, um, so here, again, we have the, um, if the algorithm, algorithm box for, for SAC. Uh, and it, you can see it's more or less, um, again, a standard uh, approximate dynamic programming algorithm where we now also added in the target values th these terms here for uh, uh, for putting the, the maximum entropy objective also into the value function. Uh, for SAC, actually, it's debatable whether you need it or not, because actually this is a constant, as we know, for this in, in the state space, because the, the, or the expectation of what that is is a constant, uh, because the entropy doesn't depend on the state. Um, if we use uh, a Gaussian policy where the covariance doesn't depend on the state. Um, okay, so the SACA algorithm is, is, I would say, right now state of the art for off policy uh, actor critic algorithms. Um, so they they compared it basically to many different other algorithms. So you can basically see here that the orange one is SAC. Um, then you have TDPG is the green one. Um, I think if you set the hyperparameters better, TDPG is also working a little bit better than here. But usually SAC is, is, is very good. Uh, and it also outperforms it here the on policy gradient methods. Um, the reason is actually you would need give on policy gradients like PPO just much, much longer time in order to achieve the same result. And usually they get better. Uh, um, but you see, it's, it's, it's quite a bit faster than this on policy gradient methods. Uh, these are now for different standard mojo co environments, the uh, uh, evaluations here. And uh, here you see some evaluations for 
uh, on, on the real robot application, if the video is playing. Oh, it does not play. Maybe. Okay. Yeah. Okay, maybe let's skip that and look at the next video. Um, it's another real robot example where they use SAC um, on the task of turning this valve. So the blue part of the valve, it always needs to point to the right, and that's basically what it learned, just from image-based input. So the input to the policy, you can basically see here. Uh, um, and that you can directly learn on the real robot. Uh, um, so it doesn't take too much of uh, real robot interaction time, something like one hour, a little bit more. It takes much more computation time. Uh, so you will wait quite a bit between the iterations uh, and uh, until you get a result. Um, okay, but so this, this maximum entropy formulation that we now used in SAC, it also has some other very nice properties. Yeah, and, and, and I just quickly want to show that here, which is also presented in this paper, also from the Levine group. It basically proves that the maximum entropy formulation, it gives policies that are robust. Uh, they're robust, for example, to unseen perturbations. Uh, so, for example, what the robot here was tasked to do is to take this, this bug here and move it to the target area. Uh, and if you use standard reinforcement learning, you see, okay, you can learn that, uh, no problem. But more or less, the final policy, it does it always in the same way, right? because there is no stochasticity in the final policy anymore. It's deterministic. Right? The SAC policy on the right side, maximum entropy reinforcement learning, you see you have the different uh, evaluations are different, right? because you have noise in the final policy. There is stochasticity in there. Right? And now you might, seem, uh, might think, mm, OK, that's stupid. That's not optimal, but actually, it's much more robust, isn't it? Because in this policy, you do have also information how to recover from errors. Right? Because you're deliberately doing something wrong. You, know, you also learn how to recover from errors. And on the left side, you have forgotten that already. The optimal policy doesn't know that anymore. Because the suboptimal states are not in your replay buffer anymore. Right? So if I now introduce, for example, after training, I introduce a perturbation that the algorithm hasn't seen, like this obstacle here. The standard reinforcement learning algorithm struggles with that, you cannot resolve it, while the max end algorithm finds a solution because it has basically learned this recovery strategy directly. And, and you get similar properties if you have uh, a model mismatch between what you, the model that you use for learning and the model that you used for execution. So the, here they basically changed the mass of the robot after learning. Uh, so you can see that here on the x-axis, the relative mass has been changed. Uh, and they test the different uh, max entry reinforcement learning strategies, so more or less SAC, with, with different alpha uh, parameters. And you basically see that. Um, in comparison to other robust reinforcement learning algorithms that they compared here, it doesn't really matter what they do, it actually works much better, and it's also more robust to these changes. And if I set the alpha higher, so here we have alpha 0, 1, and here we have alpha 0, 0, 0, 1, um, then it's more robust to the changes. That's a typical thing that you see, except for here. Here it didn't really work. Um, but the best performance at the relative mass of one, so when you don't change the uh, the model, is a little bit worse uh, because you force the algorithm to learn a more stochastic policy. Uh, and for example, for sim to real transfer, that that's a quite nice property. Even so, nobody but has really used it so far. Uh, um, Yeah, so my wrap up for, for SAC is that we have seen now an off policy maximum entropy deep reinforcement learning algorithm that is very data efficient 
Uh, it can scale to high dimensional observations. Yeah, so you can even learn from images directly then. Um, it's quite robust, different random seeds, noise, and so on. And that's why the community has basically more or less went or opted for this algorithm. There's a second algorithm, another off body algorithm that also works very well, called uh, maximum posterior entropy, uh, maximum posterior policy optimization. Um, and it's not really clear which one is better, but I think this one is used a little bit more because more implementations exist. Um, okay, so how much time do, do we have? Still 45 minutes? I'm Eight more minutes, okay. Um, but are there any questions so far for, for SAC? Okay, then um, I want to continue with the second part, yeah? robust policy optimization. And now we go back to the uh, on-policy gradient domain. Yeah? So now for algorithms that if you want to apply it on, on the uh, simulator, we don't really care about the sample efficiency. The algorithm needs to be fast, and it should give us an unbiased gradient estimate. Uh, and what these algorithms typically do is they don't learn the Q function, and they don't depend on the Q function. They depend on the returns, directly on the Monte Carlo returns. They might learn a value function for the baseline, but they don't learn the Q function. Uh, um, so they are easy to use, conventionally fast, um, and yield high quality policies. Um, but what we have seen is that in many cases, optimization can still be tricky or unstable for complex policies. Uh, I think in the policy gradient lecture, you guys covered TRPO and PPO already, isn't it? And both try to solve this unstability problem in some way, but not in a real satisfying way, I would say, uh, because they use a lot of approximations such that these nice properties of stability of a trust region that we'll see are gone, and you don't have them anymore. Uh, and we'll go into that a little bit more. Um, so maybe as a recap, so why do we need actually a, a robust gradient update? Uh, and I believe it's highly connected to the step size that you get of the policy gradient when we talk about Gaussian policies. Yeah, it's very specific to the Gaussian policy. Because what we typically do is we start with the initial policy. It has a quite high variance to cover all the space. Uh, and then we want to learn how to reduce this variance to, to converge to an optimum policy. Uh, um, and if you look at the gradient magnitudes during this learning process, they vary a lot. Uh, because the gradient of the Gaussian policy depends on the variance. Uh, if you have a small variance, the gradient will be huge. If you have a high variance, the gradient will be small. And that's why this algorithm get quite easily unstable. Uh, um, and the second problem is actually, and that's what we also see in many of these issues, uh, in, in, of these algorithms, is that the exploration, the variance, it decreases very quickly. Uh, because the algorithm finds out, ah, if I decrease exploration, my immediate performance will be, be, will be better. Uh, but actually, that's not what you want. You want to explore it such that your performance after a certain number of iterations will be better. Uh, if you decrease exploration too fast, you just get stuck in a local optimum, and you don't want that. And so typically, you get these two different cases. Yeah? Um, if you have a too small learning rate, yeah, and you, you either update very moderately, and it will take very long until you find a good solution, or if you have to have too high uh, learning rate, you update very greedily and you jump directly to the best solution you found without any variance. Uh, and both cases are not good. And it's very hard to control that, as I said, because the, ver the magnitude of your, of your gradient can vary very so highly. So, and as I said, it's con highly connected to the structure of the Gaussian policy or of the gradient of the Gaussian policy. So if we basically have a Gaussian policy where now just for simplicity, just the mean depends on 
uh, on the state. This is a neural network here, and we would compute the log, the gradient of the log density, which is the one we need for the likelihood ratio, uh, policy gradient. Then you basically see what you, uh, this gradient does. It, it, so you compute the difference of the action to the mean, and you scale this difference by the variance. Uh -huh. So if the variance is small, this gradient goes boom. Uh, it has a very, very high variance in that case. Uh, and that's why it's very hard to choose the step sizes. Uh, so in standard policy gradient, without any step size control, like the reinforced algorithm, it just doesn't work. It just doesn't do anything for more complex problems. Uh, um, so what people have come, came up with is, is to formalize the trust region problems here. Uh, and then that's very um, similar to what we have heard in the previous talk. Uh, just that in the previous talk, we had it as a different, uh, as a additional punishment term, the Kyle uh, between the old and new policy. Here, we have it now as a trust region. Uh, so what does it mean? So we want to have basically a new uh, policy or new policy parameters that optimizes the advantage. Uh, here we have the importance weighted objective, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, um, under a constraint, or actually under many constraints, so we, we want to satisfy the constraint that the KL between this new policy and the old policy uh, is smaller than some, some bound epsilon. Uh, and in theory, we would want to satisfy this constraint for every state. It's quite hard to satisfy, but that, that, that would be the optimal thing. And then if we would satisfy that, we can even get um, monotonic improvement guarantees for these algorithms. Uh, um, but the benefits is that it stabilizes the learning process because it avoids that your policy is jumping around too much. Uh, um, and it also avoids too fast decline of the variance uh, because then the KL between the old and new policy would be too high. Uh, um, and nearly all the successful policy gradient algorithms do that in one way or the other. Uh, TLPO is a natural gradient algorithm, and it's the natural gradient, you can actually derive it from this KL point of view, which is a second order theta approximation of it. Uh, and PPO is using similar ideas, but a lot of heuristics and tricks to get it to work. Uh, um, so the, the most common used measure, as we have already heard so far, is the covert library divergence, some of the properties. So it's always positive. It's only zero if both distributions are the same. Uh, it's non-symmetric. Uh, there are many different names for the Kyle, relative entropy, information gain, and so on. It's also used in many different domains. Uh, rational inference, information theory. Uh, it's coming from information theory, actually. Uh, and but now we are talking about the covert library divergence between two Gaussian distributions. Uh, and here also we have a closed form solution of that. Uh, and it's actually quite illustrative to, to look at it, uh, um, how it looks like, because it contains three different form, uh, terms. Uh, so the KL also for two Gaussian distributions, it's always a large equal to zero. It can only be zero if both are the same. It has three different terms. Uh, um, so the third term, the blue term, it uh, compares the means of both distributions, and it's scaled by the covariance matrix here of the right-hand distribution. Then you have the second term, which you, you can think of it, it compares the entropies of both distributions. Now, if the entropies are the same, then the second term will also vanish. Uh, and the first term, it compares you, you, I would call it the rotation of the covariance matrix. So it's a trace of the inverse of the first times the second covariance matrix. Uh, so it's more a geometric interpretation of the KL if you talk about Gaussian distributions. Yeah, you compare mean and the covariance in a very specific way. Uh, um, and one way to solve that, um, the, the, the trust region problem that I've given you before, is actually 
constraint optimization. Uh, um, and constraint optimization here, it's an even sim more simple problem, uh, which is now without states, just actions. Uh, so you want to find a distribution of actions where each action has a certain reward under a KL constraint. And so Q is in this case the old distribution. And another constraint, obviously, that the pi needs to be a distribution, it needs to sum to one. Um, and constraint optimization is, is basically an own field. Uh, you can solve it using Lacranian multipliers. Uh -huh. And I don't, don't have time to go into that, yeah, but I can have time to show you the solution. Um, it's the same solution we have already seen. Yeah, and that's the funny thing. It doesn't really matter uh, whether this is a constraint or an additional uh, punishment term where you have it in your cost function. Uh -huh. um, so the new policy is proportional to the old policy times x plus the reward divided by a Lacronian multiplier. Uh, the only difference to this punishment term that Matthew introduced is that this Lacronian multiplier, it can be optimized for, you know the value. So given a bound epsilon, you can optimize for eta, and you can compute eta. Uh, um, and again, you can see if you have a small eta, which means it, it directly translates into a large epsilon, then it's an almost a uh, greedy algorithm because the reward will dominate and the old distribution doesn't matter. Uh, if you have a large eta, which, which comes from a very small epsilon in the bound that we had before over here, um, then the old distribution will dominate and you won't move very far in this distribution space. Uh, and so basically, that would be the optimal way to solve this trust region problem. Uh, but we can actually only solve it for this discrete action no state case. We could also do it for discrete states as well. But um, what most algorithms do is to try to find approximations of this. Uh, um, so basically, there are there, there are natural gradients uh, and using uh, the trust region policy optimization algorithm, which is using natural gradients. Um, then there is also comp competitive function approximation that can solve that, I won't go into that. Um, then there is a proximal policy optimization algorithm, PPO, um, which was also already introduced in one of the lectures. I want to go quickly back to that and show you it's a good algorithm, but it has a lot of problems as well. And I, will maybe then after the break uh, introduce the differential trust region layers. Uh, um, so for the proximal policy optimization algorithm, it's also, as I said, an algorithm that has been discussed already last week. Uh, it's, so for on policy gradient, gradient, that's the algorithm people use right now. Uh, um, what, what it basically does is, so you have the standard policy gradient objective here, so advantage function, which is importance weighted. Um, so you directly express this importance weights here of every sample. Uh, and then it forms this lower bound of the objective by having the minimum of the standard objective and the clipped objective where its importance weights cannot be bigger or, or smaller than one minus or one plus epsilon. Uh, um, and this clipping prevents the policy from uh, having the incentive to go too far away from the old policy. Yeah, so that's the intuition about it. But the question is, does it really do that? Yeah, does it really work? Uh, and somehow it does, but you don't have any guarantee that these trust regions are really satisfied and we'll see that. Uh, and it can really destroy your optimization completely. Uh, um, but the good thing is, if you take this objective, the PBO objective, you can plug in any standard deep neural network optimizer like Adam, and he's doing all the magic for you. Uh, um, yeah. Um, if it's a clip, some sort of bias variance straight off. Sort of, yeah, because the, the importance weights, they can get 
very, very high. And by clipping them, you basically avoid that. Uh -huh. um, but it, I don't think it has been really analyzed in that way. No? I mean, and, the, and you don't directly know what kind of bias you introduce here. You, you definitely get the variance down. Yeah? But I don't know what happens to the bias. Yeah? I haven't seen an, an analysis of that. Because um, okay. uh. I think a uh, similar idea is used uh, for uh, counterfactuals in order to uh, recover past experience. So they reduce, um, so in order to reduce the, uh, the, the variance, they, uh, they have a high bias by using this clipping trick. So it's kind of the same, uh, I don't think. E, yeah, for the retrace algorithm, for example, they say yeah. it's a clip at one, I think, the importance weight. Uh, they don't do the clip from below, or yeah, they don't do that. Yeah. Say analyze it the theoretically here, it's not analyzed what it really does. Yeah, but but it, mm. it limits the variance that it does, definitely does that. Uh, yeah. yeah, okay, thank you. Um, Okay, so you can do a lot of cool stuff with it. I mean, I'm not sure whether you've seen such videos already, but this is not from OpenAI. Um, they learned actually mostly in simulation, and then they had a very good simulation, obviously, and then they could do the Rubik Cube uh, or similar things with this dextrous shadow hand um, directly in the real robot. Um, um, so that that is very impressive. And as I said, it's currently just the SOTA algorithm for on policy reinforcement learning. Um, so it's easy to implement. And basically, the idea is just throw tons of GPU on the problem, and it somehow works. Huh? But as a reinforcement learning guy, it was always quite unsatisfying to use it, because ah, the theory is not very nice. And, and actually, if you look at it, and then there are some papers that analyze PPO more, more closely, it's why it works so well, it's actually not because of the objective. Uh, it's because of all these additional tricks and hacks that they introduced in the paper. Uh, and if you implement it slightly differently, the algorithm will work quite differently. Uh, and that's basically in this Angstrom paper. Uh, so the performance boost mainly comes from the hacks. Um, it's still much better than TRPO, the previous algorithm, because it's much faster computationally. Uh, it doesn't need this natural gradient formulation. Uh, and yeah, and we'll see one algorithm that fixes most of this issue. But I think now maybe let's have three, four minutes break, and then we can. Continue. Okay, basically we stopped um, me bashing a little bit PPO. It's still it's a good algorithm. We use it as well, but but some of the theoretical or how you derive the algorithms, as I said, it's not very good. There's a hacky theory, and it depends on many of these heuristics. Huh? Um, so. But what you can do, and, and that's a rather new algorithm from our group, is to introduce something that, that is to introduce these trust regions directly inside a neural network. Yeah, and that's what we did. Yeah? It's called differentiable trust region layers. And the key idea is the following. Yeah? Um, so there has been, yeah, now it's already also three, four years ago, uh, a new uh, a, a new approach on how to build convex optimization layers into a neural network. Uh, it's from Tico Cortos group at CMU. And basically, the very general idea is if you have a convex optimization problem like this one, you want to minimize something under some constraints, inequality and equality constraints, then you can use convex optimization, so with Lacronian multipliers, and make this optimization program differentiable. Huh? So basically now this, the, the function and the constraints can have parameters coming from a neural network, and you can different, differentiate through these parameters. How exactly does that works? I don't have time to go into that, so you can basically differentiate the KKT condition. Um, but I just want to show you how you can use this for reinforcement learning. Huh? Um, because in re for the trust regions that are introduced, we have exactly this problem. It's a convex problem because the KL is convex, and the maximization is just an expectation. It's also convex. Uh, um, so 
if you look at the original objective, we have basically this one. Now, the, the, as I said, it's just a linear objective, an expectation, and a convex constraint, the KL, uh, for each state. Uh, so all, most other methods don't solve it for each state, but for the expected KL, here we can really solve it for each state. So the idea is now, if we can construct a policy, let's call it by Diller, that always satisfies this constraint. Uh, so it's guaranteed that this constraint is satisfied. Uh, then we can just leave away in our leave it away in our optimization problem and just optimize the standard policy gradient objective. Uh, and as I said, the idea is just to build this constraint directly into the policy. Uh, so, and actually, we we went one step. Further, for the kullback library divergence, you can actually decompose the kullback library divergence into one constraint for how much the mean should deviate and one constraint how much the co covariance should deviate uh, because it turned out that for the mean you can allow much higher step sizes as for the covariance because you don't want the variance to shrink so fast. Uh, um, so you have now two constraints, one for the mean, one for the covariance for each state. For each state means basically for each state sample that you have. Uh, um, so we did that to achieve faster convergence. And so basically that's how it looks like. Uh, so you have basically a neural network here. This is your standard policy. It gives you mean and covariance. Then you have your old uh, policy, also with old mean and covariance. And then you have this trust region layer. It's a differentiable layer, just as a new network layer. Uh, um, it gives you a mean, a, a new mean and a new covariance, mu dilla and uh, sigma dilla, and you use this uh, to define the loss. Uh, and then you can just back propagate through the objective to get basically a new policy. Uh, and the advantage is now, and first of all, the, um, the trust region is satisfied for every state. Uh, and it's exactly satisfied. Uh, so not approximately as for most other methods. Uh, um, so if you look uh, what, what kind of projections uh, you can use here, so we have said we use a different projection for a different distance measure for the mean and for the covariance. Um, so basically the um, optimization problem for the mean looks the following, that you want to find uh, a mean that is most similar to, to the output of the neural network. So this mu dilla is basically the output of the um, trust region layer. Under the constraint that the, this mu dilla and is also close to the old mean uh, with some epsilon mu. Uh, um, you can now plug in basically the um, mean part of the kullback library divergence for both of these distance measures here to get basically uh, this optimization program. And you can, using Lacronian optimization, solve it in closed form and basically get this solution here that the trust region mean is basically a linear interpolation between uh, the output of the policy and the old mean where this omega parameter specifies this linear interpolation can also be computed in closed form. Equation now doesn't really matter. Uh, um, you can do the same for the covariance matrix. Basically, you take the covariance part of the KL for, for this distance measure. You can again form a closed form solution of that, which basically tells you that the, uh, new, the trust region precision matrix, or so the inverse of the covariance, is again a linear interpolation between the covariance of your neural network policy that you have here and the old policy. Uh, and again, eta is a Lacronian multiplier. Uh, there is no closed form for solution for that, but you can op uh, obtain it by convex optimization, and it's still fully differentiable uh, by this, this Sigur quarter paper. Uh, um, okay, so and now we have basically formed a policy that is always um, following our trust region constraints, uh, and we can differentiate through it. 
Uh, and, and that's a very elegant way to, to solve all these approximation issues. And we tested it on uh, the standard benchmarks um, from Mojaco, yeah, like the Hopper and the Walker and so on. Um, the thrust region layers are here with different norms. So the KL is one norm, Wasserstein norm, Frobenius norm. And the result was actually, mm, it, it, it works very, it works okay, yeah? but sometimes PPO is still better. Huh? Um, there's a big difference that the thrust region layers, they work without any of these additional hacks of PPO. They just work. Uh, you don't need to do that. Huh? But still, it's like, okay, it works more or less the same. Huh? Um, but one good property, and that's what you see in this, in this plot here, if you look at um, the uh, thrust region violation of these different approaches, you have basically uh, PPO here in, in magenta. You see it's going completely crazy, or it's actually one version of PPO that doesn't use uh, the learning rate control, uh, basically where the learning rate is constant. The other version of PPO, which is the standard one, the, the, the brown one, uh, uses uh, basically the learning rate goes down to zero, so that's why you see in the end nothing is happening anymore, because you just don't learn anymore. Mm. Also not a very good solution. But you basically see this, that these thrust region constraints, they are not satisfied. Yeah? While for the other um, convex optimization layer algorithms, you, you have a very clearly defined thrust region. Uh, and, the, and, and this is not a, basically the maximum KL of all the states between the old and the new policy. Uh, um, okay, so but performance-wise on the standard benchmark task, it was not so, so much better, so we were a little bit depressed about that. But actually, it turns out that this task are just too simple to see a difference. Yeah, so here, PPO works very well. Uh, but if you take more complex tasks, PPO really ta starts to degenerate. Uh, um, so one, one more task where we evaluated now is this better well tasks. So we have 50 tasks from different manipulation uh, tasks that you have to do, like button press, door open, and something like that. Uh, and here, you can already see that uh, TPL, the frustration protection layers, are consistently better than PPO. So you can see PPO is basically the orange one, and TPL is, is this um, this brown one in this case uh, here. You can also see where SAC is. It's hard to see, but it's basically going up until here. Uh, and it's more or less the same performance as PPO here. Uh, but it cannot outperform, for example, this TRPL method. Uh, we could not could not run SAC as long as we ran the other methods because it's 10 times slower computationally. Uh, um, so all of them have been run for the same computation time. Um, okay, so we have now an algorithm that is basically much more robust for the a much more robust estimate of the policy gradient because of the trust regions. And we wanted to use it for more abstract or more complex action representations. Uh, and that's basically the last part of my talk. Uh, because in robotics, it's very important what kind of policy you use. Uh, and here we can use a lot of knowledge from robotics, what is a good controller, what is a good policy. Uh, and the standard neural network policy with random noise at every time step, mm, not so good. Uh, um, and what I want to show you here is how you can do, or, or first of all, what are motion primitives, so mo mo movement primitives, very, very quick, and how you can use them for reinforcement learning. Uh, and, uh, okay. Um, no, sorry for that. Um, so what is a motion primitive? Yeah, I mean, there's a whole research area on that, uh, but a very, very quick jump into that, what, what it is. Um, a motion primitive is basically a trajectory generator. Yeah? It gives you a trajectory, gives some parameters. Yeah? So basically, uh, Y is here our trajectory, also the trajectory of the velocities of the robot, given the parameters W and the initial conditions. Yeah? Um, and there are different motion primitive formulations, it doesn't really matter for us right now, but the properties of the motion primitive is that it has a small number of parameters for a trajectory, let's say 20 to 50 parameters, uh, defining a trajectory, the future desired trajectory 
Uh, and then you can just use the standard trajectory tracking controllers that we know very well in robotics to follow that trajectory. Uh, um, so it, it has a small number of parameters, and it's so it comes from imita from imitation learning. Basically, you can very easily take uh, demonstrate the trajectory and get the parameters of the motion primitive such that you can reproduce this trajectory. Uh, um, and now our idea was, okay, we, we want to use reinforcement learning on this representation because it has some very good properties and, and, and that's the ones that I want to, to focus on here a little bit. Uh, um, so, so in principle, there are two different variants of motion primitives that are mainly used in the robotics community. One is called dynamic motion primitives, uh, which define a dynamic system using this, this parameter W. And by, by integrating this dynamic system, you get the desired trajectory. Uh, um, there is another motion primitive variant called probabilistic motion primitive. It's coming also from our group. Um, where the trajectory is defined in simpler. You just have some basis functions in time. So it's basically Gaussian basis functions, very similar to, to a Gaussian kernel. Multiply it with W and then you get your trajectory. And recently we had a publication on combining those, but um, it, do, it doesn't really matter for, for this talk here. Uh, but the puristic representation, it basically defines a distribution of uh, the trajectory, not just a single trajectory, but yeah. Um, also for reinforcement learning right now, not that relevant. Um, so, and we want to use now the motion primitives in a reinforcement learning scenario, and, and the scenario is actually quite simple. Uh, and we call it black box reinforcement learning or contextual black box, bo box reinforcement learning. So. So how does this scenario look like? So you, you, you see a context. So basically, the context is a state telling you what the task is. Uh, for example, you, you, want, you want to move a box to a certain position. Uh, and the context is to which position you want to move it. Uh, um, then given the context, you want to select this motion primitive parameters. To, what is the trajectory you want to execute? Uh, um, given this motion primitive parameters, I can evaluate the desired trajectory very easily. And given the desired trajectory, I can just plug it in a controller, BID, or BD control in most cases, um, and the robot is doing the magic. Huh? Um, so the big difference now to standard reinforcement learning, and that's why we call it black box, is that this is like a bandit. Huh? You choose W only once, and then you execute. Done. It's only one action, but it's a high dimensional action. Uh, so there, there's also no way to recover. If you choose W wrong, then you execute and you're, you're screwed. Uh, but you need to choose it in a good way. Uh, so the same action, which is the motion primitive parameters in that case, is used for the entire trajectory. Uh, um, but it, it's still quite complex uh, because you have the context in there. So for different contexts, for different tasks, you want to take different trajectories. Uh, um, and again, you want to maximize now the, the return. Uh, so the return is basically, or the expected return is, uh, and the return depends now on this W parameter uh, and the context. Uh, um, and you also have a distribution over these context uh, vectors. Uh, um, yeah, so, so in principle, this is a contextual bandit, uh, but with infinite amount of arms, because this W is high dimensional and continuous. Uh, um, OK. So, so why is this a good idea? Uh, so first of all, we, we have a small number of parameters that we want to optimize, this 20 to 40 parameters of the trajectory. Uh, and we can directly explore in this parameter space of the motion primitive. And we don't explore in the action space anymore. We only explore in the beginning. Uh, that 
uh, yields to correlated exploration over time, uh, not this random walk behavior. Uh, then, in this, also nobody has s told us how the rewards should look like. Uh, the standard reinforcement learning setup is the reward needs to be Markovian, needs to depend on the state and the action. Here, no, the reward can depend on the whole trajectory. It doesn't matter. Uh, so it's a very free formulation. Uh, and in addition, and that's I think one of the main advantages, there's much less noise. Uh, so in the step-based setup, even in a deterministic environment, the returns will be noisy as hell because I explore it every time step. So it's very hard to say whether the action at the first time step was good or not because afterwards so much noise is happening, I have no clue. Uh, here, the deterministic environment, the, reward, the returns will be deterministic as well. Yeah? So it's much easier to find out which parameters are good and which are bad. Yeah? But obviously there are also some disadvantages. Yeah? So, um, so first of all, the trajectory is just it's an open loop trajectory. Yeah? So we don't react to, to changes, in, unexpected changes in the state, yeah? perturbations. There's no sensory feedback, but we will come to that. Uh -huh. And it's sample inefficient because every trajectory is just one sample. Yeah? While for the step-based formulation, every trajectory is 200 samples or something like that, depending on the length of your trajectory. Uh -huh. So actually, and that's why people didn't really do that because it sounds like a stupid idea. It's very inefficient in that way. Uh -huh. um, on the other hand, if you compare to step-based reinforcement learning, we have a deep neural network policy that selects an action at every time step. You have a huge amount of parameters in these policies, and the exploration is done in action space. Though the good thing is it's very fle flexible because you have this closed loop feedback using a neural network. Uh -huh. um, but as we will see, it's very inefficient for the exploration. Uh, there are other methods also for dealing with that, but we cannot go into that. Um, so why is this the case? Because the Gaussian noise introduced by Gaussian policy is like a random walk. Uh, and random walk is not very good for ex exploration on a real robot, and we shouldn't do it anyways, um, because it re uh, resides into unsmooth behaviors, very unsmooth behaviors. Uh, um, OK, so, and I've also told you that in a black box setup, actually, we can use much more general reward definitions, or return definitions, which we call non-Markovian returns. So why does it make sense? Um, because often it's easier or more direct to define the desired behavior like that. Uh, if you look at the whole trajectory and judge the whole trajectory and not a single state. Uh, one simple example. If the views would be playing. Okay, so some of the videos are broken here. Um, but um, yeah. one sim uh, sim uh, simple example would be jumping. Yeah? If you want to jump as high as possible, it's very easy to give a reward on the trajectory, the maximum height. For a step-based algorithm, it's very hard. You could give the height at every time step, but that's not what you want, yeah? because then you would jump all the time a little bit. Uh, and not achieve the maximum height. The same for a table tennis environment. Uh, um, if you want to hit a ball in table tennis, one natural way of, of defining you want to hit it is the minimum distance of the racket to the ball. And this minimum over the trajectory, it's again very hard to define as a Markovian reward. And you can much easier define it like that. Uh, so in, in many setups, it's defining this Markovian reward is not that intuitive, and it might bias the behavior that you actually want. Uh, um, okay, um, so okay, let, let, let's accept now that black box reinforcement learning might be interesting as well, uh, even so it's quite inefficient. Uh, um, so as I said, okay, the same action is used for the entire uh, trajectory, uh, it, it, and that basically um, the consequence here is that it, it, we really need to learn a highly accurate policy. Yeah, because we have only one shot. Uh, if we choose the W slightly wrong, the performance will be very bad. Uh, and so we need a 
uh, reinforcement learning algorithm here that is giving us highly accurate policies. Uh, and the first thing we tried is to use PPO in the setup. Uh, so only one time step high dimensional actions and that doesn't work. Uh, but differentiable trust region layers because of these nice properties th that I tried to show you, say do work. Uh, um, so, so here you have some quite simple case studies. Yeah. So we, we evaluated or we started our evaluation with, with two different environments. One is, one is a reacher environment, but, but you have a five-link robot and it needs to reach different desired positions. So the context is a desired position. Uh, and the other one is a box pushing environment that you can see here uh, below. So these videos seem to work. Okay. Um, where you need to push a box to a desired location and desired orientation. So actually that's a not that simple task. Uh, um, and we also played around with different types of rewards, uh, dense rewards and sparse rewards. And here we mean sparse in time. Uh, so the dense reward gives the distance to the desired location at every time step. Uh, the sparse reward gives the distance to the desired location only in the end, the last time step. Uh, that might not seem like a big difference, but actually it is. Uh, so because the step-based reinforcement learning algorithms like PPO, they are really made for this dense setup. The reward need to basically almost in every time step it needs to tell you what to do. Uh, for for the uh, sparse setups, they don't work very well. Uh, while black box reinforcement learning, it only gets the return anyways. It doesn't matter when, which time step it is. Uh, so th it also works well in the sparse reward case. Uh, um, so, so here you can basically now see the different behaviors. So this is now for dense rewards. You can actually see for the box pushing task. You also see how he has to change the rotation of the box sometimes. So the blue side needs to correspond to the blue side of the green box. Um, and that seems, that works pretty well. Uh -huh. um, if you want to do that with motion primitives and use PPO as optimizer, it, it does work, but it's not very accurate. Um, but if you use these trust region layers, it is much better in that way. Uh, uh, because the policy gradient using the trust regions is, is much more accurate, uh, or no approximations. Uh, yes? Uh, I repeat the question. Um, so the question was, do you care about the whole trajectory or the function of the trajectory? Um, yeah, I mean, it depends on the task, obviously. I mean, uh, here it's the dense reward, so it's the whole trajectory. Uh, um, in a sparse reward setup, it's only the last time step, uh, but for, for the distance to the, to the goal, but you have additional rewards for every time step, like the, the action punishment, as you want to use low actions at the, all, all the time. So you have that at every time step. Uh, so it depends really on the structure of the problem. And for the non markovian thing, you would use a minimum over the trajectory or the maximum over the trajectory or something like that. So you don't know which time step it is. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, okay, I think. Yeah, and, and this is the same for, for sparse rewards, and here you can already see that PPO is <laughs> uh, finding something funny, so it's trying to, to, to throw the, the object to the desired location that sometimes works, but not, not, not most of the time. Yeah? <laughs> While, uh, like this black box reinforcement learning setup used using motion primitives, um, you see it, it does a quite nice job here. Yeah? Um, Okay, now you could actually ask the question, why do we want to use sparse rewards if the dense rewards already work with, with, with reinforcement learning, step-based reinforcement learning? So it turns out, it depends what you want. Yeah? For example, if you want to have additional objectives, like it should be energy efficient as well, the motion, this is very hard to get with a step-based reward function. 
Uh -huh. Because the step-based reward function is forcing the agent to move very fast to the target. At every time step, you want to reduce it. Yeah? While the sparse reward function, it only cares about the end and doesn't matter how you get there. Uh -huh. um, so here you basically see the energy efficiency for different contour costs and you see, um, depending on the goal distance, that this black box formulation, it gets, at the, for the same goal distances, much better uh, energy efficiency that you couldn't reach with a step-based reward. Um, and another property, and that's what I said in the beginning, is the smoothness. Uh, so we evaluated now different uh, step-based and motion primitive-based policies at the beginning of learning and at the end of learning. Uh, and you can basically see at the beginning of learning uh, this is just a random policy, isn't it? Um, so that, that would be a position trajectory of one of the joints of the robot, velocity trajectory, action trajectory. Yeah, actions are obviously very noisy. Uh, while for, for the, the motion primitive approach, everything is nice and smooth because you just generate a desired trajectory and then you follow it. Uh, um, then, but even for a trained policy then, you see the trained policy is much smoother with PPO because you reduce the variance and you learn to generate something smooth because that's part of the objective. Um, but it will never be really smooth because it's, uh, every time step the stage is different and there is no constraint for the policy to be smooth. You know, so that's something, you get something like this kind of action profile. Uh, um, so it will always be quite less energy efficient than the trajectory-based version. Um, so we also applied this again on this MetaWorld tasks, 50 different tasks, and also here you can uh, see that the quality of the fine policies, so here you don't actually need any sensory feedback, you can just def define from the initial state what is the trajectory you want to execute, there are no perturbations, that the motion primitive-based variant um, which is, in this case, uh, the blue one, it even outperforms the thrust region layers uh, in the step-based variant uh, because of this better exploration properties and smoothness, smoothness uh, inherent smoothness built in into the policy. Uh, um, we also looked at, at other examples like the, the hopper that was part of the motivation for the non-Moncovian rewards. Um, if you look at different algorithms, again, uh, the blue one is thrust region layers, the green one is PPO with motion primitives, and this is just PPO, uh, the orange one. Um, it's always interesting to compare the behaviors. Y you see PPO would basically, it would jump and then it would jump all the time. It's not really high. Or non you can actually jump much higher. And from... Um, the motion primitive based black box formulation, you get such a jump, which is quite a bit higher than uh, for the step-based versions. Uh, because you can directly say in the reward, the maximum is what counts. Uh, um, and yeah, okay, for some more results, you can see that here in David Dennis, maybe just show you the videos. So David Dennis is very hard to learn. Yeah? It's very hard to define a good reward here. You can see what BPO does. It does a little bit of crazy dance. Yeah? Um, and you can see what this black box formulation does. Um, so here the context is defined by the initial ball trajectory, but also by the target where you want to, uh, to return the ball. Yeah? So it's not fully accurate, but it's obviously much better than, than this jittery thing here. Yeah? Um, okay, um, but one thing actually that, that is still not really satisfying is this completely black box formulation that you only generate one trajectory and that's it, so you cannot react to unforeseen events. Uh, so the question is, can you now do replanning here as well? And um, it turns out that this is pretty easy uh, because uh, the trust region layers are just the policy gradient formulation. So you can very easily add 
replanning time steps where you reselect the motion primitive parameters. Uh, and with some of these motion primitive formulations, like this ProDMBs, that works very well because it still generates smooth trajectories, doesn't really matter. Um, so that's a very recent publication or submission that we had to JMLR. We call it MP3, Movement, movement Primitive Based Replanning Policies, where you basically you have two feedback loops. You have one inner feedback loop of the controller that's predefined, and you have another feedback loop on a much larger time scale, maybe only five times in an episode, you reselect the motion primitive parameters of the trajectory. Huh? And then you can do things like box push pushing, again, where the, the target, for example, is changing randomly during the, the episode. Huh? Um, and you can already see that in for dense rewards, PPO has a lot of problems here. Doesn't really do much. Huh? I mean, it does something, but you see it's, it's quite desperate. Um, why is this the case? Uh, we believe that this random change of the target position at some time step uh, is adding a lot more variance into returns. Uh, and PPO already breaks because it has already so much variance in returns by the step-based exploration. In addition with this variance, doesn't work very well. Huh? Um, Replanning here works much better. If the video would play. Come on. Maybe I can do this again. No, okay. Somehow my video player doesn't like me today. Okay. No. no. Okay. It works much better. Now you see that in the rewards. Um, um, okay. So similar things for for David Dennis, where you can basically see uh, if you learn with replanning, it it work also learns more efficiently because now you have instead of one sample per trajectory, you have maybe five samples, depending on the number of replanning time steps. And um, you basically see, uh, now again, there's a evaluation. If you do standard PPRL and with replanning, it actually produces better policies that are a little bit smoother yeah, because you have more training data. And you can also introduce perturbations like wind velocities that are unobserved and then you can replan, and this also works um, with this replanning approach uh, um, that you can basically see here. Um, yes, and I think I'm running out of time. Could it be? Yes. Okay. Then I will quickly finish. I have a few more slides, but I will not cover them. So you have them uh, on the web page, so that's fine. Um, but just to my uh, wrap up what, what we have seen today. So I started with off policy versus on policy discussion on that, and which is basically a trade-off between low bias versus more sample uh, complexity. Uh, so on policy with, works very well, well with the low bias. You get better policies in the end, but it takes a lot of simulation time. Uh, and here again, it depends whether you want to optimize the simulation on the real robot. Um, we have seen that maximum entropy objective it induces better exploration, robustness, to model mismatches, diversity, I was not able to show that anymore. Um, we have seen that trust regions can be also implemented uh, more in a more principled way using this convex optimization. They don't require hacks and give you better policies. And that allows us to learn also with more abstract action representations in a more principled way. And that was my talk, and now I think it's time for lunch. <laughs>